Just a little bit of background about the organization I work for. Um, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, we're a member organization. Um, we kind of function a little bit like an independent extension service. We work with farmers on training and education. We have a big conference. Um, we run some apprenticeship programs and we do a little bit of research. Um, our membership is primarily farmers, um, about half farmers, as well as quite a few aspiring farmers. And then we also bring together people from uh, other aspects of the food system, uh, professionals and educators, as well as you know, families and consumers and people that like to eat food. Mainly we're in Pennsylvania, but we also have about 20% of our members in neighboring states, in including New Jersey. One of the things that I think is neat about PASA is that we're not strictly uh, an organic organization. We actually don't really have a definition of sustainable agriculture. If somebody has a good idea about how to make a farm more sustainable, we're really interested in working with them. So we try and have a more outcome-based concept for sustainable ag. And that kind of led us to this question of really understanding from the perspective of our farmers, what did it mean to be sustainable? And if you could measure that, how would you measure that? Um, and so. In the uh, fall of 2016, we had a series of focus groups around Pennsylvania. Uh, we talked with over 60 of our member farmers uh, from a wide range of places across the state and farm size, farm types, vegetable farm, livestock farm, dairy farm, so forth. And they were all pretty consistently telling us that in terms of like quantifiably looking at the sustainability of their farm, they were really interested in three things. They were interested in financial viability, soil health, and the nutrient density of the products they were producing. How healthful was the food they were growing? And of course, these are all really very deeply interconnected. You know, you need healthy soil to produce healthy food, uh, especially in the Northeast. You need a very high quality, nutritious product to compete and stay financially viable. And I think you need financial health to invest in your soil for the long term. Um, so it was really interesting to hear this kind of consistent viewpoint um, and it's also, of course, very pertinent from a climate change perspective, from adapting to climate change. You know, of course, we know that soil health is very much a fundamental aspect of any kind of adaptation strategy for climate change. You need healthy soils, uh, particularly in the Northeast, with uh, the, the, the water extremes we're experiencing uh, to be able to absorb extreme rainfall events and to store soil moisture uh, for the more uh, intense periodic droughts we're, we're experiencing in, in Pennsylvania and throughout the Northeast. So certainly we heard a very clear message from our farmers is that we want to look very quantitatively at soil health, we want to improve soil health, and we're really dedicated to soil health. So uh, with that in mind, in 2016 we, we started a project called uh, the, the Soil Health Benchmark Study, and this is really a pretty simple idea that we want to help our farmers uh, kind of operate as citizen scientists and collect some coordinated and consistent information on soil health uh, so that they can benchmark each other and, and see how we're doing as individual farms but also as a community uh, and, and develop some strategies for moving forward. So we developed a pretty, pretty simple protocol that our farmers are using with uh, some collaboration from um, scientists at, at Penn State with uh, Charlie White at Penn State and, and Christy Borelli. And uh, basically there's two components. One, we um, get some field soil samples that we send to the Cornell Soil Health Lab, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. We look at three fields on the farm that kind of span the rotation of that farm. And then we ask for some management records at the end of the year for things like tillage and cultivation, uh, planting dates for the crops and the cover crops, as well as soil amendments. And some of our farmers are using um, clipboards and paper notebooks to get these records to us. Other farmers are using um, some, some apps that are available uh, that we're kind of helping to promote to, to do some more kind of modernized record keeping. We started this project with about 12 farms in 2016. This last year, we had 29 farms participate. So we had 25 organic vegetable farms. Uh, and then as a pilot project, we also worked with four um, no-till grain, grain growers from the PA No-Till Alliance throughout Pennsylvania. And so what we're finding, um, oh, I also, I guess I'll just point out that this, this study framework really kind of adapts right into the um, NRCS's soil health framework of the four principles of soil health, providing living cover continuously, minimizing disturbance, maximizing soil cover, and maximizing biodiversity. So between our soil tests and our farm records, we're really able to get a more quantitative look and, and benchmark how folks are doing with the, these principles. 
we, we, like I said, sent the samples to the Cornell um, Soil Health Lab for the Cornell uh, quantitative, Cornell comprehensive assessment of soil health. Has anybody worked with this soil test before? A couple of folks. I think it's a pretty amazing tool. Um, it is a very robust look at not just you know your kind of classical chemical fertility aspects of, of soil health, but also at some of the biological measurements, so uh, soil organic matter, soil respiration, and then some of the physical dimensions of soil health, uh, aggregate stability, water holding capacity, and other measurements like this. And it kind of looks at these things in a very integrated way. And then I think one of the other cool things about the Cornell Soil Health Test is that they will grade your sample on a curve. So they'll take your score, uh, your soil sample, and they'll compare it to other similarly textured soils and, and, and group those uh, on, a, on a sort of a 1 to 100 scale so that you can compare a little bit across soil types and you can look at soil health not just as a function of your soil type but relative to uh, similarly textured samples. So this was kind of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the core from the ground soil health assessment tool we used. Uh, and then we also had these management indicators from the farm records. So we looked at living cover from the planting dates. And so uh, if a farmer told us they planted a fall cover crop over 100% of the field, we would weight that uh, times the days of the year that that crop was in the ground. If a vegetable farmer had cover crops in the inner row of their planting, we would look at, say, maybe 40% of the field uh, getting cover during that, that time period. We had logs for all the tillage uh, the farmers were doing and collected information to score the, the implements using um, basically something derived from the Russell models. So where uh, more primary tillage, like a disc plow, gets a score of 39, and uh, a tine weeder, a more surface implement, gets um, a score of 7.9. So we can look quantitatively at the amount of tillage that, that farmers are doing. For 2017, we, we found pretty much across the board that our farmers we're doing, I would say, a very great job for, for soil health. So come, some of the kind of highlight numbers here, we found that the, uh, the days of living cover, so how many days of the year the fields are covered with living vegetation, was on average 237 days. Just to put that in perspective, in Pennsylvania, if you have a corn-soy rotation without any cover crops, you're looking at only 156 days. So two-thirds of the year we have living vegetation. The soil organic matter was on average four and a half and compared to what, uh, what would be expected for their soil types, we had an average of 2.4%, so almost a doubling of, of the expected organic matter. And in the Cornell system, these farms had a, um, a score of 80 on that 100-point scale, which Cor Cornell calls optimal. So really uh, very, very promising and, and uh, really great soil health. And we're kind of working to use this information to communicate more to our kind of consumer audience at, in PASA um, some of the great work that, that their farmers are doing for, for soil health. This research, I think, has a really, um, really valuable extension dimension for helping farmers learn from each other and, and communicate best practices. And so the way we're doing that is, you know, we have this range of uh, soil health scores. Like I said, most of them uh, were in the optimal range, but there's certainly some farmers that are just really crushing it. You know, they have scores in the 80s and 90s. They just have fantastic soil health. So we want to find them and work with them and make an example of them for our community. So we do field days on some of these really high performing farms. Um, we had a really great field day uh, last September at, at Spiral Path Farm, which is a, a very successful organic vegetable farm in, in south central Pennsylvania and really kind of did a, a top to bottom tour of their farm using these soil test results to explain their systems for composting, for um, transplanting, crop rotations, um, crop health all, all across the board. Um, the other way that, that this data can be really useful is that we give each farmer a benchmark report. So we show them their soil health scores, uh, their management scores relative to their cohort, to their peer. So just for example, we would give a farmer a, a, a graphic like this that shows them where their farm was relative to the cohort of other vegetable farmers with, with those uh, data points anonymized. And I found that this can be a really simple yet powerful tool to, to get farmers motivated and get good conversations started. So when we shared this report with these farmers in uh, January of last year, they were interested in cover cropping, they were trying to cover crop, but they didn't realize that they were only getting about 150 days of living cover a year. Uh, and they didn't realize that a lot of their peers were up at about 300 days a year. That was really eye-opening to them, really motivating to them, and it was also not very hard for us as an organization to 
set them up with conversations with some of these farmers that have figured out how to get you know, two thirds or more of the, the year covered in living vegetation. So I think this will be a really neat tool moving forward to hopefully move, move, move the whole window, um, move the whole average forward in, in these soil health metrics. Then the, um, the last thing I'll share with you just uh, as I'm running out of time here is, you know, we're just starting to look at this data uh, that's come in from the, the fall study. But I think one thing we're certainly seeing is that I would say there's many different paths to soil health. So here is that tillage index I told you about, um, uh, compiled for across the, the study farms. And here is their overall Cornell soil health score. Um, I didn't really include a trend line here because we don't have one. As far as I can see, we see examples of um, high tilling farms with great soil health and uh, low tilling farms with great examples of soil health. So there's many different ways to do it, different pieces to soil health. And, and this data isn't just explained by the organic matter inputs, uh, you know, compost and manure on these farms. It's a combination of things. It's, it's the, the inputs, the amendments, the, the rotations, the cover cropping. Um, there's, there's many different ways to get to um, really high functioning soils, I think. And just kind of two of the, the main strategies we have seen in our vegetable farmers um, is, is one really focused on what I would call healthy crops, healthy soils. So even in the context of organic rotation where you're using tillage to control weeds, we see farmers that if they have a really intense focus on crop health and cover crop health and really linking these things together in an intensive rotation, we can see very high soil health. Uh, we also see a number of farmers that kind of practice more of a, a rest and recover strategy where cover crops will be used in a, a one to even four year fallow period sometimes with grazing incorporated to, to let the soil build up and recover after, after tillage. So moving this forward, we're really hoping to grow the participation of farmers and uh, like I said, really make a lot of those um, high performing farms, pull out interesting case studies and continue to use uh, or work with those farmers to, to find new best practices and, and transfer knowledge to the whole spectrum of farmers we have participating here. So it is the end, I, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions now or to follow up throughout the meeting.